Hello and welcome to this deep dive into the 73P mic preamp kit. Now, as you can probably tell from the look, this is our recreation for the 500 series of the preamp section of the legendary 1073 preamp and EQ. Now, our design philosophy with this is that basically this design was perfect when it was made in the 60s. The look, the sound, the way it behaves, so we don't need to improve or change anything. Our job really is just to get everything right. Now that's easier said than done, which is what this video is going to go into great detail about. Uh, but before, before we get to the inside, let's take a look at the outside first and just go over the features. So we have this very recognizable red gain knob here that can give you up to 70 dB of gain. Moving down to switches, we have polarity, low Z, which is input impedance, 48 for 48 volts fan and power, and LN for the line input, uh, which engages the line input, which you can do through the back of the 500 series rack. Uh, and then output trim for if you want to drive the preamp to get some color out of it without clipping the next stage. And finally, a DI high impedance input on the front panel. But where it really gets interesting is on the inside, and that is what we're going to take a look at now. Let's talk about what makes this thing what it is, or in other words, what's required to make a great clone. Um, so some things you might notice just visually are these huge transformers here. Blue input transformer, red output transformer, these are made by Carnhill. Um, we've got these metal can transistors here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them. Um, and then this big output transistor here. These are all, you're going to see all of these in any vintage um, or good clone of a 1073 mic preamp. Um, we've also got, now this, I took this out of here, belongs here. Um, this big mechanical switch here. Um, this is called a Gray Hill, that's who makes that, which brings us to the truly interesting thing about these preamps, which is their circuitry. Um, let's just walk through this block diagram real quick. Um, so the mic input comes in. The first thing it sees are the switches for uh, low Z, 48 volts, line input. Then we have the input transformer. And then we're skipping this stage for right now because it's not always in circuit. But let's say we're at 30 dB gain right now. We're going to go through this. This is the um, this switch, mechanical switch. We go to preamp 2, output trim, output amp, output transformer, final, finally the polarity switch, and then out into the external world. Now what's remarkable about this design is that there are three preamp stages. If you, if we were looking at a API preamp uh, or almost any other vintage or modern mic preamp, you would only have one gain stage. Um, if we were looking at, let's say, an API 312, um, the circuit would look like this. You'd have <laughs> input transformer, preamp, trim, output transformer, uh, and that's it. Now the reason that Neve did it this way is because of the state of components at the time, basically. Um, to keep these transistors happy in their linear range, that is not distorting, not excessive noise, not oscillating, um, they needed to keep the gain of each stage in a pretty narrow range. Um, so 18 is the minimum gain for one of these stages, 30 is the maximum. So they, they knew they wanted to keep it in that range while having a massive 70 dB of gain. So what they did is they used this three-pole switch that switches a bunch of things at the same time, um, but without getting too in the weeds with that, it's controlling attenuation before the preamps or in between them here. It's controlling which stage is in the circuit. Um, so this preamp one, only gets engaged at 55 dB of gain. Uh, and it's controlling the gain of these preamps. Um, preamp 2, the gain is, is switched at 
the 45 and 50 dB settings. Um, so it's a very complex switching scheme, but it makes everything work beautifully, and it's also a big part of the sound of these consoles and of these units, um, because you're going to see here a ton of passive loss and then active gain, and then passive loss, active gain, passive loss, active gain. If you were using a Neve 80 series console, you'd have even more of that. After this preamp, you're going to go to a passive summing bus, and then you have makeup gain from that. Or maybe you go to an insert, you have the faders, you know, gain and loss, gain and loss. That's how all those beautiful, subtle layers of sonic varnish are applied to the signal and part of what makes um, these preamps so musical and so versatile and everything. Um, now while we're here, we should address the fact that um, some preamps that are purport to be clones of the 1073 do not have three stages. They just take out preamp one and, and just have preamp two and the output amp. That is not the way we're doing it. We're doing all three stages. Um, but there is a precedent for this um, from Neve's own consoles. This is a 1272. This is a line amplifier that Neve made. Um, this is a real vintage 1272 here. And you'll see if we compare them side by side. You know, it looks a good bit like ours. It's got these metal can transistors, um, input transformer, output transformer. You know, it's all, it's all mirrored here. The only difference is it doesn't have this big multi-pole switch, multi-deck switch rather, um, and it doesn't have a second preamp stage. It only has five of these um, smaller transistors rather than eight. Um, Neve never meant this to be a mic preamp. It's a line amp. It's only meant to do, um, I forget the exact amount of gain, but not 70 dB. Uh, but what people realized a couple decades ago when the used prices for 1073s started going crazy and essentially the world started running out of them is that you could also take the 1272 models out of the console, wire up a switch like this to it, and make it into a mic preamp. That's super cool. They sound awesome, and they don't sound that different from a 1073. Um, but they are different. And if Neve could have done their mic preamp with two stages, they would have, because they would have saved a lot of money. It would have been a much you know, simpler circuit. Um, so we have decided to go with the three-stage design, which is the classic 80 series mic preamp. 1272s are a cool thing too, um, but they're not a 1073, and they shouldn't be sold or marketed as one. While we're talking about the circuitry, I want to point out something that's often overlooked, which is the way that we've done the power supply. Now, in any piece of gear, not just Neve preamps, the power supply is super important. It just doesn't get as much press as stuff like the transformers that the audio actually passes through. But it affects everything about the way the preamp performs. Um, and something, a unique challenge of putting a Neve preamp like this into a 500 series format um, is that power comes into the 500 series card um, at plus and minus 16 volts DC. It's a dual power supply, it's 32 volts total, whereas these old 80 series designs ran on just 24 volts. Um, so a single power supply and a lower voltage. And I really believe that in order to do the clone correctly, you have to um, convert the power down to 24 volts. So with that said, there are several different ways we could go about this. Um, what you'll normally see is a little chip here that's an integrated regulator um, or a DC to DC converter. These are things that work great. They're kind of more modern things, uh, but they really work too well in our opinion. Um, and what you want is a regulator like Neve would have used back in the day. Um, the power supplies attached to these consoles were also from the 60s. These were not, you know, state-of-the-art current things. Um, no pun intended. Uh, so what we've done is we've used this kind of obsolete regulator technology of a Zener diode and a pass transistor. So that's 
what we see here, there's two transistors here. One of them is the output transistor of the preamp, and one of them is for the regulator circuitry. And what this does is it replicates the way an older power supply would have worked by being imperfect. Um, so when the, when the preamp needs a ton of current instantaneously, like let's say a big low E on a bass or a kick drum hit or something, um, older power supplies, in older power supplies, that 24 volts will not stay perfectly at 24 volts in the instant that all that current is being pulled. It's gonna sag a little bit, is what that's called. And so we've intentionally designed a rather saggy vintage power supply here, and it does affect the sound. It essentially introduces a bit of compression and clipping uh, that's very pleasant and unique. And as far as I know, we are the only 500 series uh, 1073 style preamp with that kind of uh, power supply regulation. Let's talk a bit about parts. Um, so one of the challenges of adapting a 60-year-old design to a modern, modern format um, is that those parts that they use just really aren't available anymore. Or if they are available, they're manufactured in a very different way. Um, so it creates all these challenges and all these controversies over which parts to use. Um, the most important parts to the sound of this unit, if I had to pick one, are the transistors. The transistors provide all the gain, and they're really where most of the saturation, um, slew rate limiting, other artifacts that make this thing sound the way it does are going to come from. Neve used several different types of transistors, different model numbers over the lifetime of the 1073. Um, an irony is that, you know, they weren't very picky. They would mix different types of transistors in the same console between uh, different channels. And back then, manufacturing tolerances were much wider. So two transistors from different batches with the same model number could be as different as different transistors with different model numbers. You know, it's kind of a bottomless pit once you start trying to pin down exactly what is the correct transistor. Um, that's not really something there's a simple answer to. So what we've done uh, for our gold standard is to use these transistors, which came out of uh, a console. Um, so we did a bunch of recordings and listening of these exact transistors in this circuit, but then we also desoldered them. We took them out and put them in our circuit. And so we could compare apples to apples, how different transistors compared to these in our circuit. So what we've ended up with are um, the BC109C. Uh, it just happens to be exactly one of the model numbers that Neve used. Again, I don't think we should put so much stock in that because model numbers didn't mean as much, didn't, you know, the, these are not made on the same machines that made the ones 60 years ago. But we did end up with the same model number. It is, you know, it is, they are trying to make the exact same transistor they made 60 years ago. It's just different, different standards, different equipment. Um, we auditioned a lot of transistors and what we found is that in the linear range, that is when the preamp is not being pushed very hard, the difference between transistors is not so big. I mean, it's almost, it's barely noticeable on just like a single instrument. Um, but once you push that gain above where it quote unquote wants to go, the, the transistors are night and day different. Um, so we found some that I believe are very, very close to our reference models here. Um, and they happen to look just like them too, which I always appreciate. Um, transformers were easy. Um, Neve used transformers in the original consoles from two different manufacturers, St. Ives and Mariner. The St. Ives legacy essentially continues unbroken to today. The, this company, Carnhill, bought St. Ives, which was the, the supplier, one of the suppliers for the original consoles. 
Um, and they still make, you know, these transformers. This is what you'll see in, dare I say, most um, clones of the 1073 and for good reason. Um, so we, we saw no reason to deviate from the kind of gold standard of the Carn Hills. Capacitors are the final piece of the puzzle in terms of getting the sound right from a parts perspective. Um, and the most important ones are these polystyrenes here, which are these little kind of clear ones, which are all over the preamp, the, uh, the amplifier sections, and then tantalums, which are these orange yellow ones. Um, these uh, cylindrical ones are aluminum e electrolytics. Um, they are also important. Most of them are in the power supply path rather than the signal path itself, so have slightly less effect on the signal. But what we found in our listening tests of taking things out, putting things in, listening, 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 is that the most critical is that to use as much polystyrene as possible where Neve used them and the tantalums. Luckily, these are both types of capacitors that are still made. You will see clones of this without polystyrenes. Polystyrenes are not easy to get, they're not cheap, but we find them to be important to the sound and tantalums are absolute must have. So that is how we arrived at all of our parts level decisions. I think they're all as close as we can get. Um, they're all very thoughtfully considered and chosen by ear and also with, um, with a view to kind of the legacy of the parts. Just listening to these next to each other, um, this vintage 1272 and our 73P 1073 clone um, at the gains where uh, the 1073, the 73P is only using two stages because this is the 1272 is two stage, so we need to compare apples to apples. So when we compare these, they are so, so close. And I would wager they're as close as kind of any two channels in an old console are next to each other because they could be using different transformers, different transistors than the one next to it. So this has been a deep dive into the 73P. I hope that you found it interesting. Thank you so much for taking a look. I hope you can see why I feel confident in saying that this is the ultimate DIY kit for building your own 73 style preamp.